Hello, and welcome to the Rio Hondo College Library Workshop, Evaluating Online Sources for College Research. In today's workshop, I will be discussing online sources, such as articles and information found on the internet, usually through Google or social media, and some of the current issues with bias and disinformation within these sources. Then, I will give you some tips on how to fact check your sources to make sure that they are credible, reliable, and acceptable for your research. There will also be a quiz on the information that you will submit in order to receive credit for your participation, and I'll give you more information about that at the end of the workshop. So, I'd like to start with the word bias, which is defined as prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another, usually in a way considered to be unfair. This is an important concept because so much of the information that we find on the internet or social media is plagued with bias and disinformation. When we talk about online bias, a good place to start with is algorithms. These are step-by-step -step instructions that computers follow to complete tasks, solve problems, and make automated decisions. They use data to make predictions about people, including their preferences, attributes, and behaviors. Algorithms power nearly everything we see online, including search engines, apps, and social media. They are used to shape and filter content on the platforms many of us interact with daily, such as Google, YouTube, Instagram, Netflix, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, and Spotify. So, in a nutshell, algorithms work to customize our online experience by collecting data about what sites we visit, what we like and share on social media, the things we buy, even where we go. Now we've all seen algorithms at work when we look at something online, then the same thing pops up later in our Instagram feed, or even when you get in your car after work and your phone tells you how many minutes it'll take to get home. So algorithms can actually be helpful and a good thing sometimes, but because algorithms have become so important in the shaping and filtering of the information we receive, and customizing our individual online experience, some problems have started to occur. The first problem I'd like to talk about is called algorithmic bias, which is when algorithms reflect the implicit values of the humans involved in their creation or use. It's important to know that online information is not always neutral, and even though computers drive algorithms, people still work at companies like Google, Facebook, or YouTube, and these platforms have been known to reflect actual human biases. Some examples of algorithmic bias include search results that reflect racist, sexist, phobic, or social biases, algorithms that are used to influence critical decisions. This is when companies sometimes use online platforms or specialized software to determine who they hire or who they fire, who gets approved for loans or insurance, or who gets into college. So bias that is built into these systems is an issue. There's also recommendation algorithms on YouTube, Facebook, or other sites which have been known to radicalize viewers and send them down a rabbit hole of disinformation and conspiracy theories. Now, because of the attention and criticism that online platforms have received, many companies have started to work on fixing algorithmic bias, but they still have a long way to go. Next, I'd like to talk about what's called the attention economy, which is when algorithms are used by social media platforms and news organizations to keep our attention focused on their websites. So why is our attention so important to these companies? Well, it's mainly because of engagement. Digital platforms have discovered that the best way to keep us engaged with their websites is to promote sensational, divisive, or outrage-inducing content which is also known as clickbait. They know our emotional responses are what keep us clicking, liking, commenting, and sharing, but also spending our time and our money on their sites. This graphic shows an example of a typical Facebook post. It says, this will make you cry. Posts that emotionally hijack your attention will do better on social media. And this statement has been scientifically proven to be true. Here is an example of how social media posts are sorted 
based on how many likes or how much interest they generate. So instead of stories being organized in chronological order, which puts the newest stories on top, the stories with the highest likelihood of engagement, which again are the ones which invoke a strong or negative response, are promoted to the top of your social media feed, while more lighthearted posts, such as restaurant recommendations or baby pictures, are typically buried towards the bottom. The second graphic also shows a basic sorting algorithm that shows four different types of social media posts. The one that invokes a negative response, thing my friend is angry about, has the highest engagement time of four seconds. And because of this, social media algorithms automatically promote posts like this to the top of your feet. Some of the negative effects of algorithmic bias and online platforms fighting for our attention also include polarization and filter bubbles. Polarization refers to the separation of society into different groups. These groups have led to what are called filter bubbles, when people tend to only engage with information or other people that they agree with, while filtering out opposing views. Also, since stories and information that elicit outrage and grab our attention have become what people engage with the most, a great deal of online information has become intentionally false in nature, which has led to the epidemic of online information disorder. False, made-up online information is now referred to as information disorder. And we used to call this fake news, but the meaning of that term has changed from information that has been proven to be false to information that someone just doesn't agree with or doesn't fit their narrative. And because of this, many information professionals no longer use the term fake news. But when it comes to information disorder, there are three main categories. The first is misinformation. This could be unintentional mistakes or inaccurate information that is generally not harmful in nature. This can also apply to satire websites like The Onion or TV shows like The Daily Show that are comedic in nature but report on news stories and can't always be relied on for balanced and accurate reporting. Disinformation is fabricated or deliberately manipulated content intentionally created conspiracy theories or rumors. Of course, this has become a huge problem within our society. Online disinformation has led to increased polarization of people, the rise of hate groups, and the spread of false conspiracy theories. Just look at the comment section of any news story to see how divided and hostile people have become towards one another. Lastly, there's malinformation which is deliberate publication of private or sensitive information with extreme intention to harm. Both disinformation and malinformation also include trolling, doxing, cyberbullying, and a variety of harmful online scamming methods. As you can see, it's important to be aware of online bias and disinformation. Not only as college students who rely on online sources for your research, but also as consumers and creators of online content. It's also not my intention to make you distrustful or cynical, but when approaching online content, it is healthy to be skeptical, to ask questions, and to be able to fact check the information that you find. So next, I'm gonna focus on how to evaluate online sources and information. Okay, so if you're feeling overwhelmed by this stuff, know that you're not alone. In 2016, a study asked nearly 8,000 students in middle school, high school, and college to perform five web evaluation tasks. Here are some of the results. 80% of students couldn't distinguish sponsored content, such as ads, from news articles on websites. 67% of students failed to recognize potential bias in online information. 65% of students took online images such as memes, videos, and photos at face value, and almost all struggled to evaluate information on social media. So how do we fix this issue? The best way is to learn and use some of the online evaluation methods that professional fact checkers use. Next, I'm going to play a video that introduces the concept of fact checking and how the majority of people struggle with sorting good online information from disinformation.
My name is Mike Caulfield. I am fascinated with how to sort truth from fiction on the web. And I'm here to give you a simple set of tools that will help you to do the same. The particular moment that we're in right now is a moment of transition where we're all going to the web for information, but almost none of us have had true training in how to use it. Some people wonder, what does it matter whether something on the internet is true or not? And for a lot of things, it doesn't. But for a lot of decisions you make, there are consequences. And the most obvious of those is you will eventually vote for somebody. And you'll vote based on the information that you have. If that information is false, you may end up voting for someone that doesn't actually represent your interests. My core interest is how can we give you the skills to make sure that information you're getting is the best possible information that you can get. So I want to show you two websites. This, this here is the first website. If you can see this, this is the American Academy of Pediatrics. Now, the American Academy of Pediatrics is an organization founded in the 1930s, a budget of something like 80 million, 60,000 members, considered by pediatricians, scientists, and governments as one of the premier authorities on the health and well-being of children. Okay. On the other hand, this is the American College of Pediatricians. Now, the American College of Pediatricians was founded to protest the adoption of children by same-sex couples. Okay, It's not a professional organization. It's considered by many to be a single-issue hate group. So these two sites are from completely different universes, and it should be pretty easy to tell them apart, right? Some Stanford researchers recently looked at just that issue. They took three sets of people, Stanford students, professional historians, and professional fact checkers, sat them down in front of a computer, and gave them five minutes to figure out which would be the more credible source. So how did they do? Well, the answer is not very well. First, let's talk about the historians. Half of the historians couldn't say for sure which site was the more credible site. The Stanford students, how did they do? 65% actually chose the website considered by many to be a hate site as the more credible source. Finally, we had the professional fact checkers. The professional fact checkers, 100% of them got it right. And not only did they get it right, but they got it right quickly. A lot of people in the other groups used their full five minutes. These fact checkers got it right in seconds. So what accounts for that difference? The fact checkers, they used a set of skills that are web native, a set of skills that help them very quickly get to the truth of the matter. I want to show you how they use those skills, and that's what we're going to start to do in the next video. Okay, so as you saw there in the video, both Stanford students and historians had a hard time figuring out which of the two sites they looked at was from a valid professional organization. Yet fact checkers were able to quickly and easily pick out the best source. Next, I'm going to show you two methods that fact checkers use to determine trustworthy and reliable online sources. One recently developed method of evaluating online sources is called the SIFT method. And this can be really helpful in determining whether an online source is credible and trustworthy. SIFT stands for Stop, Investigate the Source, Find Better Coverage, and Trace Claims, Quotes, and Media to the Original Context. And I'm going to go over each one of these steps with you. We begin with S for Stop. And this is possibly the most important step in evaluating sources because it asks us to hit the pause button before sharing or using online information. Remember that we tend to engage with information and stories that make us angry or give us a strong emotional response. So when evaluating online sources, we need to begin by checking our emotions. Also, because of what's called confirmation bias, we tend to share, like, or believe information that confirms our own beliefs and dislike or disregard information that we disagree with. So, before you share that story and further contribute to the problem of online misinformation, you want to do some work first. Next is I for investigate the source. 
This requires you to find out about the author or organization that is publishing the information. Now, most websites have an About Us or Information page that will tell you something about who is running the site, but this information isn't always 100% reliable. So, professional fact checkers use a method called lateral reading, which requires us to get off the original page and investigate the author or organization using other websites. I'm going to play another video that is a continuation of the last one, which will show you how to investigate your sources. In the last video, we talked about how fact checkers outperform some of the smartest people in the world. In this video, I want to show you one of the techniques they use to do that. Let's go back to the original example. Okay, We were looking at these two sites. One of them was a long-respected professional organization. One of them was considered by many to be basically a hate site, right? So how did the fact checkers quickly discern that it was a hate site? Now this may sound absurdly simple. They came to this page, the American College of Pediatricians, but they didn't read it. They got off it. They went to another page. They went and did a Google search. They started asking themselves, who are these people publishing this information? Once you put in a search like that, a Wikipedia page comes up that talks about it as a socially conservative advocacy group. Its membership, it says, is estimated at 500. You'll see that they have an annual budget somewhere of around 80,000. This is not uh, a comparable organization to the American Academy of Pediatricians. The point here is, in order to find out the truth about an organization you're looking at, do not look at what the organization says about itself. Look at what the web is telling you about the organization. That's where you're going to find the truth of the matter. I'll show you one trick that you can do that makes this technique super fast. Most fact checkers use Wikipedia as a starting point. It's usually a great first stop for investigating journalistic sources and organizations. Take this example, an article from a publication called The Telegraph. So a lot of times I'll come to a site like this and I'll wonder, is this really a news site? So here's what I can do. I can go up to the location bar and I can chop off everything after that initial domain name. Then I type Wikipedia after it. Don't forget the space. And then I hit return. Now if you do that, it will float the Wikipedia page to the top of your search results. And if you click into that Wikipedia article, you can see the Telegraph it turns out to be a well-respected publication. You can do this with organizations, publications, experts. Wikipedia won't always return a high-quality article, but it usually returns a good starting point. If you get to a Wikipedia article and you're not sure you can trust it, just scroll to the bottom. Every fact in Wikipedia should be sourced to another publication. By clicking through to those articles, you can verify the individual facts in the Wikipedia article. Okay, so I like that video because it shows how you can easily find out more information about your source from sites like Wikipedia. And we'll be doing a similar exercise in the quiz portion of this workshop. F is for find better coverage. This involves finding reliable, unbiased sources, which can require some work on your part. So if you find information on social media or YouTube or a meme, and we want to know if it's accurate and truthful, we should be able to find another, more reliable source to verify that information. Also, a lot of the news we get online is secondary information, where they're just re-reporting a story that was originally published in another source. So whenever possible, Try to track down the original source and research the information there. This also applies to Wikipedia, which was mentioned in that last video as a good way to find information. But we also know that almost anyone can edit a Wikipedia page, and in fact, most instructors won't even allow you to directly cite Wikipedia in college-level research papers. So any facts or information that you find there should be traced back to an original source. These sources are found at the bottom of every Wikipedia page in the References section. This makes it relatively easy to track down information to the original source in order to verify it. Just like we need to investigate the source and find better coverage, we must also investigate the truthfulness of the information itself.
Lastly, the T in SIF stands for tracing claims, quotes, and media to the original context. Like I mentioned, it's important to track down the original story. This is especially true when using memes, videos, and images. Here's an example of a meme. We typically see these on social media where they bring text and images together to convey news and ideas. This one quotes Abraham Lincoln saying, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. Now, of course, there's no way that Abe Lincoln could have actually said this because he died over a hundred years before the internet was even invented. But the idea that we should be skeptical and not believe everything we read in the press is something that he probably would have agreed with. With videos and images, it has become even harder to judge whether they are true or not. Deepfake is a recent technology that allows someone to superimpose a face on another body in order to manipulate video content. And of course, Photoshop and other photo editing tools make it easy to manipulate images. Here's an example of a photoshopped image that went viral. It shows a pilot taking a selfie while flying. But on the right, you can see the original, unmanipulated photo, taken while the plane was grounded. So, believe it or not, a lot of people see images like this and actually think that they're real. So, whenever you find images, videos, or memes, it's important to verify them before sharing. You can simply do this by googling the meme or image in question to see if it's been verified, or do what's called a reverse Google image search, where you can right-click an image and Google will often provide you with the original source. Another option is to use fact-checking websites, and I've listed a few reliable ones here. Snopes is great for fact-checking everything from urban legends to news reports, and I use Snopes almost any time I hear a questionable story in the news and want to verify if it's true. There's also factcheck.org and politifact.com, which are more political in nature and good for checking the truthfulness of what politicians say. To the right is a media bias chart. This one was developed by a nonprofit organization called All Sides. Several charts like this have been developed over the years to help determine where news organizations fall on the political bias spectrum. The news organizations in the middle, like NPR, USA Today, and Reuters, tend to consistently report non-biased news. So these are the types of sources that you would want to seek out for your research. The sources on the left are more liberal in their reporting, starting with CNN and The Guardian leaning left, to sites like HuffPost and Slate being more liberal. And the opposite is true for sites to the right, where reporting is more conservative. Sources like Fox News and Epoch Times report from a right-wing perspective, while Breitbart and OAN are biased, ultra-conservative sources. Both extremely left-wing and right-wing news organizations have the tendency to disguise opinions as facts in order to engage and enrage their intended audience, and for this reason, these sites should be avoided when conducting college research. Next, I'd like to briefly talk about library resources, which can greatly help you with your research. This workshop has mainly focused on finding sources through Google, social media, and other mainstream platforms, but the library provides access to databases like EBSCO, ProQuest, and Opposing Viewpoints, which are all excellent places to find reliable articles and information. We also have an extensive collection of books in the library and ebooks that you can access at home through our library catalog. And as Rio Hondo students, you have free, unlimited access to all of these resources. Along with our online workshops, the library is also back to hosting in person workshops. To check out our in person workshop schedule, click the Library Resources tab. Also, librarians like myself are another great resource. We are available remotely through chat, Zoom, text, and email. And we're also at the reference desk in the campus library. Just visit the library's website at riohondo.edu slash library to link to us, or come visit us in person. We're eager to help you with your research and finding the sources you need. 
So to summarize, whether you're doing research or just casually using social media, watch out for bias and disinformation. This requires you to ask questions and to be skeptical of the information that you find online, but try not to become too cynical. Using fact-checking methods like SIFT, lateral reading, or fact-checking websites will help you to evaluate sources and give you the ability to separate good information from bad. All right, that's it for the lecture portion of this workshop. Thank you for listening. Next, I'm going to give you instructions on how to take the quiz. To take the quiz and receive credit for this workshop, start by going to the Research Guide page and clicking on the Quiz tab at the top of the page. Follow the instructions on Part 1 to open the website minimumwage.com. You will need to use this site to order questions 1 through 3 in the quiz. To take the quiz, go to Part 2 and hit the button that says Click Here to Begin. Be sure to enter all of your information correctly so I can send you a workshop certificate once you're finished. Thank you for taking this workshop. I hope you learned some new strategies that will help you with evaluating sources.